This type will be about classified GXD, probabilistic classification of gene by three and interactions on the molecular count phenotypes by Rubik Waller. Waller. Yeah, it's Professor, Department of Genetics, University of North Carolina, Carolina and Chapman. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me okay? <laughs> Great. Um, uh, thank you to the organizers for the talk. The organizers for the talk. Um, so I've been interested in uh, gene by treatment interactions for a while, um, and uh, mostly in um, how to detect gene by treatment interactions. Um, this talk, though, I'm going to be describing a tool I've been working on to um, to uh, uh, classify uh, gene by treatment interactions once you've found them, and in particular, we're going to be focusing on um, um, molecular count phenotypes such as uh, RNA seq and ATAC seq. Um, so I'm going to start with some background on uh, GYT and existing methods of manipulation. And then I'm going to talk about this tool. It's called uh, classified G by T. And it's really composed of two parts. One is a probabilistic uh, classification, which basically means you get uh, probabilities for intuitive uh, classes. Um, and then the second part is how we've adapted a, um, a kind of a straightforward way of doing that into something that's more targeted towards uh, RNA seq than actually in other uh, sort of count methods. Uh, and I'll talk about some applications to experimental data. So this is work done by um, a really fantastic student of mine and uh, Mike Loves called Eureka uh, uh, Aragaya, and she's co-mentored uh, between me. I'm interested in GYT. And uh, Mike Love, who's the uh, developer of uh, DEC2. Um, and this is also work in collaboration with uh, Jason Stein, who's a neuroscientist at UNC. So, gene by human interactions, um, of course, so, uh, people differ in their um, response to, to, to a treatment, whether it's a drug treatment or some other sort of treatment. And there are many reasons why uh, that might happen, many sources of that variability, and one of those sources is uh, genetics. And if you have a locus uh, somewhere in the genome that where, where the genotype um, affects what the uh, response to that treatment is, we'd call that a gene by treatment interaction. I should say, by the way, that when I talk about gene by treatment interactions, pretty much all of this would carry through to uh, to the general study of gene by environment interactions, uh, gene by sex interactions. So gene by treatment interactions are obviously uh, potentially very informative for uh, clinical decision making, personalized medicine, pharmacogenetics, and so on. And current practice and the biggest sort of concentration of where um, methods have been is on uh, finding uh, the presence or absence of a G by T interaction. That is trying to detect G by T interactions. Is there one here? Is there not one here? And what we're doing here uh, in this project is more, okay, well, once you've found them, um, how can you have some kind of vocabulary, some, some kind of uh, formal way of um, distinguishing different types. And so I'm just going to illustrate this a little bit. So this is um, a plot of how a uh, phenotype might change the genotype um, mm -hmm. under the control and uh, treated conditions. So you can see this is an example where genotype affects uh, phenotype, treatment affects phenotype, but there's no actual G by T interaction. And then we can uh, variations of this where where there is a genotype um, so there is a g by t interaction so uh, we often call this an altered case where uh, the effect of the uh, genotype is altered by the treatment and the variation of that and one could also think of an induced 
uh, case, which is where the uh, the treatment uh, induces an effect of genotype um, on the phenotype. Uh, and there's a variation of that there. And uh, why is this useful? Well, in terms of um, you know uh, following up uh, um, candidates and thinking of underlying uh, mechanisms. Um, you know, particularly in the kind of, uh, you know, uh, like the gene expression space, one could imagine some kind of a cis regulatory element um, where, when a, trans when a transcription factor binds to it, you know, you have, um, have a gene expression, um, you know, maybe that transcription factor is part of the treatment, but, um, that only happened under uh, one of the allelic states. And so here you would have this sort of induced um, G by T. Um, and so uh, before I talk about distinct about uh, distinguishing different types of G by T, I'm just going to briefly go through how uh, G by T loci would be detected in, in the first place. And um, that's gonna connect to a bit afterwards. Um, so one way in which you might uh, detect uh, G by T loci is through a stratified um, analysis. So this would be where you might have your control population and you'd be doing some sort of a GRAS or uh, QTL mapping. And then you do the same with the treated population. Um, and then, you know, you could say, for example, uh, the SNPs that appear in your the, uh, you know, the hits that appear in your uh, in populations, those are the ones that, that correspond to the induced effect, the ones that don't also um, occur in the control population. So this is good at um, identifying induced loci. It's a little bit hard to rank importance. It's, it's a bit clunky in terms of interpretation. Um, and a problem that I quite like when you can do it is uh, the delta approach, which is to uh, define a phenotype, which is basically the treated minus the control. And you can do this in paired data, for example, data where you've got inbred strains um, that exposed to treated and control. Um, and then you would use that delta as your phenotype with map based on that. And this is simple and can be powerful. It doesn't need paired data though. And it doesn't immediately yield any kind of G by T classification. And then the last approach, which you're probably most familiar with, is uh, the interaction model approach, which is where you fit a model that's got genotype and it's got an effect of treatment and it's got an effect of genotype uh, by treatment. And so you're looking at that, the uh, significance of that last term. And this is pretty flexible um, uh, in, in that you don't need uh, the data to be paired to be on an outbreak population. Uh, it, it, it again doesn't um, immediately to a, uh, to a G by T classification. So um, this is a motivating data set we use from uh, Jason Stein's lab. And uh, this is from uh, um, a genotyped primary human neural progenitor cells. But you know you can imagine these humans, maybe they look like mice or rats. Um, <laughs> just, just have to think about that. Uh, um, and so these were, uh, some of these were um, exposed to uh, to a control, some were exposed to a growth stimulation treatment, and then um, RNA seq was uh, measured on them. And uh, Jason Stein's group, they uh, they went ahead and identified gene by treatment interactions, interaction type of approach. Um, and they found about 100 gene by SNP pairs that have these uh, significant interactions. But there's no principal way to prioritize SNPs there with a specific type of G by T interaction. Um, and, and so that's that's sort of part of the motivation, um, along with lots of other studies on mice and rats that we're doing. Um, so how do we go about the probabilistic classification part? Well, uh, what we really wanted was um, where, where you input a set of SNPs, 
both with their genotypes and um, phenotypes, and neither SNPs nor have already been identified as having a significant GYT effect. And then you have an output that looks something like this, where, um, where you've got all of the SNPs, and then uh, for each SNP, you've got some sort of a posterior probability with this type of GYT, with this type of GYT. That seems like it's something that might be quite useful for guiding uh, follow up studies. Um, there is an existing uh, method to do this using paired data uh, from uh, around 2010. Uh, it doesn't really been used after that. Phase. And in general, it's it's a pretty ignored area. Um, so so it seems like it does can. Um, so the approach that we took was to fit a Bayesian uh, linear model. So this is the linear model that, uh, that I was showing earlier, where we have a genotype effect of genus, uh, effect on a genotype by genus interaction. And then we can imagine kind of switching on and off those different components of the model. And um, I've listed all of the different ways you can switch them on and off down at the bottom in submodels M1 to M8. So um, M1 on the left hand side. Uh, zero, zero, zero means there's no genotype effect, no genotype effect, no genotype effect, no interaction. Um, on that left. So, different types of models. Um, and these have the, the first lot have no G by T, and uh, the second lot, those are all have some G by T. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this because we're basically using basic regression. Um, the, the second part is is that we that, that uh, something I hadn't appreciated before was um, that when we're applying to the RNA seq data, there's there's a feature of RNA seq data when you when you're interpreting uh, um, linear models applied to it that you have to be careful with, and that is that uh, molecular count data such as RNA seq with respect to the genotype is linear only on the digital scale, so got uh, counts here um, for different uh, genotypes and we can see that it's uh, linear uh, except nobody analyzes it on that scale because we have the test of that as higher variant. Um, normally what people do is they do something like a log transformation uh, and then they apply a linear model to it. Um, that's actually non-linear on, on the log scale. It deals with the noise but it, it doesn't deal with the linearity. And that can lead to inaccurate um, effect sizes, and in our case, potentially faulty uh, classification. Um, and so, what we did was we we adapted a way to to, to basically model the the effect of the alleles in, in a non-linear way um, using something called a non-linear model, which I'm also not going to get into. So. Um, when we apply that to our, to the data, and we're currently um, trying to apply it to the rat data. Um, we end up with uh, in classifications like this. So this is an example of some um, this is using um, RNA seq data and then uh, stereo probabilities for different um, uh, classes. But uh, the nice thing is that we can look at it with a large number of uh, gene SNP pairs and give some sort of a classification like this, where all of these were um, significant, most significant from uh, left to right, but they imply different um, G by T um, mechanisms. And so we have a way to kind of uh, formally describe this. So, Basic model selection framework um, for uh, classifying G by T, hopefully useful, uh, provides more interpretability. Um, the nonlinear modeling can help when it comes to RNA seq and taxes and so on. And there are some quick response or QR codes there for the software and for the manuscript. Thank you.
Well, get your pieces of the more for categorical treatments, right? Where you might have only treated and not treated, but I think the model is much more about to deal with continuous treatment, which might be more like exposures, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think which that's like a different um, it's summer. Yeah, so it's looking at it that it looks like there wasn't maybe way to do it. I'm wondering if the software is a dominant model for the impact so that the treatment by attempt which is a different. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Um, we wanted to start with something maximally uh, um, interpretable. Once, once you do what, what you're describing, you potentially end up with a larger number of models and it becomes more overwhelming. So, so we're trying to start and talk and just build up to the capital science and dominance. So. What is the software video? Yep, kill that The title is PyGraph, a high throughput Python package to perform and visualize large scale genetic association analysis. Okay. Let me just check. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is the sound effect. Okay. So, my name is Sarah Sanchez. I'm a bioinformatician in the Dormer Lab. And I'm going to give like, a, just a brief talk about our Jewel's pipeline that we call PyProx. And basically, what we have like, in the Dormer Lab is that we work mainly with HSRAX. And we have, we collaborate with several uh, collaborators and we aggregate data from a lot of like different sources so we have like up to 10 different projects we collaborate and we work with like hundreds of traits tens of thousands of genotypes and so what we needed is just to find a way to standardize all of these like different projects to have like this one simplified way to analyze them in a similar way so when we provide like the genetic analysis to provide something that everyone have like the same results in the same like format with the same quality. Um, so to do that, uh, like what you're sitting right over there, uh, we started like developing like a pipeline that is going to aggregate, aggregate like the different sources of genetic analysis and just concat concatenate them all and just get like the results to append to each one of them, generate like a full pipeline. So in the end, like what is the pipeline? It's going to be a Python package. The idea is to curate the traits, do genetic analysis. Also, because we are work with different species sometimes, we can we want it to be work with any species. We want to visualize these results, and when whenever we visualize something, we want to be almost paper ready. So like we can just get the result and just like copy paste straight to your manuscript. Uh, and second, like uh, we want to just get like target genes. And do and facilitate any posterior analysis from it. So, like in the end, we this, this pipeline is just necessary, just like uh, traits, genotypes, uh, how do you want to evaluate your interaction, and you're gonna be able to produce like an HTML file that you can gonna have like all of necessary analysis to produce like a manuscript. Okay, so like the first part, like before we even do any genetic analysis. 
it's like we have to take care of like uh, the aspirations. And it's very common to find like just like imputation errors for like from different people. Uh, so what we do is that before we even start like doing the genetic analysis, we develop like a pipeline for the aspiration. And we try to make it as simple as possible. And what we did, so like and second, we gonna see gonna see a lot of plot here, like it's very, very blurry, as you can see. Um but the idea is that we can just get like iterate over each one of the traits, and then we're gonna be able to see the means, the averages, and the solution of each one of the covariates, and we're gonna be able to filter them as we go. So we can make sure that like before we do any analysis, all everything's gonna be curated, there's not gonna be any errors. Uh, especially imputation errors that are very common. And just like we can also understand, uh, we cannot be able to show, like in this case, is a trait that it induces with like body weight. And here there are different like uh, researchers that did the measurement. So just by this quick iteration, we can clearly see that like are there are like differences like in researchers and how they, how they measure them. So we can just like prepare and curate it even before we do an analysis. Uh, after we curate, we can just regress out any covariates that we have. So, like the, the nice thing of the pipeline is going to be auto removing like the covariates. So, like if the covariate has no effect on the trait, it's not going to be imputed. Uh, and the second part is also like allows to separate sexes. So, like if I'm going to do males and females, I can easily separate them in different blocks. And uh, Third, we can also do time series regression. So sometimes like the traits, they're not linear. A lot of this or normal regression pipeline is a linear regression. So we are also allowing just non-linear time series regression. And the last thing is that our outputs are always a non-distribution. Um, and so like it will make it very easy for the dual subsequent to be just like we have like one single uh, one singular threshold. Uh, and like the good thing is just like it's very simple, like in terms of like coding, uh, it's gonna be just like one line of code, and it's gonna show like in your report here, just like the screenshot of like our report. And it's gonna say like, oh, like these are pre-processing, these are our traits in the y-axis, and these are covariates on the web, the x-axis, how much they matter, and that's like you know like how much like we was regressed out, and you can just like diagnose. Uh, in the future to see like if it was expected or not. Okay, so after the trait is curated, we can first like check the heritability of the trait, uh, and we use the CTA for that. And basically, we'll say okay, uh, if if our trait is gonna be heritable and genetically, and like once we know that, we can just say like oh, like, our trait is genetically enough, and we can just say like. With this is like a good standard. We can just have like a good base measurement, and uh, after that, like we have like we know that the retreat is curated and heritable. Uh, we can do, or okay, sorry. Uh, we can do generic correlation because like once we measure many traits, we can see if like these blocks of traits can be highly correlated, and we can just like do any latent factor analysis. And this is like an example also from the core reports that here we can have like a diagonal of heritability. Here are phenotypic correlation and here genetic correlation. It should be hopefully a, a manuscript writing figure. And we can see that we also use the p values of like genetic correlation not to overestimate uh, any necessary problems with the figure. Uh, and after that, we can go to basically or the bread and butter of like our, our center, which is doing GWAS. So we use the CTA for like all the GWAS, and we use hollow views for plotting all the points. And we can see that like, an example, this is like a porcupine plot from our report that stacks all the GWAS results. And you can see here, like for this project, there are like many details that we are able to identify. They're correlated to like all the traits that was initialized, like included in the, in the project. Uh, and after that, we can go to either, uh, each single one of these guys. It's going to be each one of the QTLs. And we can see, uh, and like here's going to be like part of the report also, that you can find like the top snake, uh, like the trait, and like the, the genotypes of the founder population. So we know like from which founder, like this uh, genotype comes from. 
Uh, after that, like we can just zoom in like in each one of those three cells. So we can go back here for each one of these so three cells. We can just zoom in for to identify genes in this case. Uh, and just like, again, like we try to simplify as simple as possible. Like, so just like in this case, we just call local zoom. And after that, and like for each one of these genes that we identify, we can just have like links to other resources that are pretty efficient, right? So we can have gene parts to find like a description of this gene. We can see like in the G1 catalog to see if for humans, are there other traits that are related? We can check like in the literature using GenePath. Uh, we have like the CLS lab, we have GPACE, and we can find a link for RGD. So like all of this resource, so we can quickly transition from your QTL to like all the resources that can find like further information. Uh, second, we look for annotations. We use VEP for those annotations. And we can see like in this case, um, in this example that we had, is just like for next to our QTL, uh, we found a communication in this case, like in the pyrosinase. And here is just like we know that is a missense variant. Uh, after we do annotations, uh, we also can do sequences. And it's basically like from our own databases, which are actually also available uh, publicly, uh, we can colocalize or top snip to other traits that are found like in the same region. So like in this case, we can call like from our pipeline, just PIOS, the PIOS function, and it's gonna identify here as we can not see. Uh, <laughs> it's just like for our top snip, like it's described here, you're gonna see like a table of every single other trait that is nearby is within like an R square of like at least 0.8, and it's like a maximum like distance of that maximum three megabases. Uh, and like after we found like uh, keywords, we found like uh, variants. We can also look for eQTLs and sqtls based on Ratchy tags. So we just pull like the data. We can try to colocalize or top snip from with eQTLs and sqtls. And like I feel like one of the main advantage of our pipeline is that it is really easy to download and really easy to run. So basically, with three lines of code, we can we're gonna be able to just download with like via via GitHub, and with six lines of code, we're gonna be able to just go from your traits and your genotypes back to like a report that it has like enough information that you can provide any further analysis. And with this, I want to say thanks to to our lab, to our collaborators, and to our current sources from the P50 and the P30 group. Yeah. So right now, like we do, like like of the kind of off the shelf, we do like for sex click. Uh, so like oh. just right now, it's just for sex, not for group. But we can like when we're regressing out, we can group by first, and then regress out for each group in the family, and then aggregate them, which is also like a, But I don't think that's what you said, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. So I'm thinking of thinking that one thing that I started thinking is to do, and then you know you see something in the value, and that creates two traits out of one, and then you can compare those two traits as the traits, and then you have a result. Yeah, we want to for a second now. Like there's like a flag for just waiting for sex, but not for group just, but it's a very easy. It can be good for you. Yeah. Next time would be about um uh, time twenty four update and the network by your things associated for the department of genetic 
genomics and informatics at the University of Tennessee. Professional trainer told me once that uh, you know people learn one thing in one day. You're doing a good job, right? <clears throat> so I only made made thirty five slides for fifteen minutes. So G Network, um, most of you've seen it. So I'm going to do a demonstration tomorrow about more of the genetic side of G Network. So I'm just going to give some highlights today. So one thing we're working on is a genome, genome browser. Um, people know JBrowse if they're working with rats because the rat genome database has it. Um, let me give a quick demo. It's possible. It's that way. <clears throat> Just to show you what you know how it works. So we've got a whole genome view here, right? Because we got we got a full uh, Manhattan plot. Um, if you zoom in. Uh, you can quickly go to, to chromosome level. So what's really inter interesting is that, um, you know, it's fast. At some point we should get a gene track, right? So if you have a snip here or a hit, right? I mean, this is not a hit, but you can see it. You can you can build it down to the to the to the GWAS track to the sorry, to the gene track, and go further down, and this is a uh, you know one and a half me uh, megabase level. And here we get it. Here we get the snip track, right? So um, I've lost the others because I didn't keep track of where they were, but. Um, uh, you can see it all together if you want, and you can you know generate plot plots on that. But what's really interesting here here for us is that we we made we made the GWAS uh, uh, plot ourselves, yeah. So that this this track, so we have the technology now to to uh, add new tracks to JBrowse. Yeah, so the second demo I'm going to give is about uh, large language models. You've probably heard of them. Um, and one of the problems we have with them is that, you know, is the, is the aspect called hallucination, at least when you want to do what you, you want to use it for research. So one thing you can do is create a RAG, which is a retrieval augmented generation system. And the idea basically is that you upload, you know, uh, um, a number of manuscripts, for example. In our case, we've done 3,000 manuscripts. And when you query, you use the natural language processing, you know, from um, a large language model. In this case, it's OpenAI in the back end um, to analyze the text, right? And then you, when you post queries, the queries get analyzed and then the responses, the responses get analyzed, right? And you get something that is, uh, that, you know, that feels quite normal when you work with it. And I'll demonstrate that. Um, the key thing to understand is that, the, you know, the responses that you get are limited to the, to the manuscript that you uploaded. So you're not querying the world, right? But you're querying a subset. So unfortunately, oh, is it readable? Barely, right? Um, yeah, this is because Zoom is projecting this also, and uh, it somehow loses information. Um, yeah, so here in Gene Network, we can uh, do a query, for example, for the BXD and the nicotine. Let me do it live also, just for a second. Let's see. All right, so we have, when I do a query, I don't know if anything's happening here. When I do a query, I actually do two queries. You know, the one is the query as we know it in G-Network, which is, which is uh, showing loading. Um, or oh, this is on G-Network itself, sorry. So we've had a talk on hypertension and rat. Um, so I'm going to query that. OK, now you see two things happening. One is the original uh, gene network search, which will, which will pop up. But in the background, we're also querying the LLM or the RAC. Right, so you're getting a response from um, 
uh, related to uh, hypertension and that large mouse. And um, you can see that it's actually returning mice um, as, as, a, as a response, right? And as a, it's, it's finding the rat hypertension because there's a description there that has rat and hypertension in it. Okay, so this is somewhat limited. But in the meantime, uh, the LLM has also uh, come back, right? And, it's, and it gives you here an, uh, some output. Yeah, so, so it's actually querying the rag for hypertension and red here, all right? And when you go in there, um, it gives you, it gives you the, the response to generate it based on the question, right? So the question was provide an answer on hypertensive and red context genes. Um, it gives you the response, and the response is a can be a, com a, a compilation from responses from different tests, from different man manuscripts, right? So it builds it up as a, as a, as a single response. But what is better is that it actually gives you the, the sources of this response, right? So these are the texts that have contributed to the original response. And you can visit, the, visit those. Um, it shows you the abstract from PubMed. It also gives you a link to the PubMed, PubMed article. And yeah, so where that information is coming from. And that turned out to be an hour's paper. So yeah, well, what's also interesting is that, um, you know, you can see some recent uh, publications, but there are also, also, they can be a really old one, like 2009. Yeah, and I think uh, <clears throat> we've actually uh, um, presented this and given this, you know, for uh, people to analyze and to, to look at the responses. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the feedback is that it's, it's, particularly useful for people starting out in, you know, some some research topics so they don't know very much. Yeah, so you get access to all these articles that are related to gene network in some way. Um, but even for more advanced uh, researchers and, and full professors, including, um, <laughs> they've, they've said that uh, they learned something new, right? So even, you know, from this very simple system with 3,000 manuscripts, well, first of all, they found manuscripts that didn't know existed in the first place. Um, but they also found some new information, and uh, you know that's that, that's proving quite quite useful. We also have a feedback system here. You can do a thumbs up, thumbs down, right? So we have an interactive system that people can say, you know, this 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 this, this response worked for me, and it didn't work for me, and we use that to you know to for downstream analysis. All right, why well, we have good here. Yeah, so so you can. I mean, we 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 found results. Uh, you know, when you ask for um, um, hypertension and rats, you got we got mouse results, right? So you, you can narrow down on the species. So the search is you know has has uh, features that you can, for example, say you know I only want responses that related to species rat, yeah, or group BSD BSD or whatever. Um, we also have wiki contents, which is the kind of metadata we have we carry in G network. You can also search on those. Yeah, so yesterday we were talking about heart disease in the BXD. Um, yeah, so this is a response that comes out of that. And it found a 2016 article on the coronary, coronary heart, artery heart disease, or coronary ar ar artery disease, sorry. Um, and you can see there's even a 2001 uh, article in there that was used. Yeah, so species rat is a, is, a, is a subset of it. Yeah, and if you look in the database, so, you know, apart from the LLM, you also, you know, get the standard uh, gene network results. Um, you can see some, uh, some massive uh, um, block P values there. And yeah, we, we, so we, we pre-compute um, p-values using uh, uh, Haley knot, um, you know, which, which, is, which is kind of different from what we do with, uh, with, the, L, with the linear mixed models, the LMMs, you know, this is this, just to confuse everyone. <laughs> LLMs or LMMs, you know, I get it wrong all the time. 
Um, but yeah, so when you look at the search results, we, we have this sort of uh, um, database, you know, filled with p-values and uh, log p-values, and they they uh, um, are have been computed with Huddy not, and we're changing that. So we're, re we're recomputing everything now using linear mixed models. So there was a talk this morning about obesity and red. Yeah, so we have also, uh, um, I tried some some things there, and you you can also do this, you know. So G Network, uh, um, of course, is an online web resource uh, for the for the large language model or manuscript corpus. To query that, you, you need to log in. Yeah, so we that's the only requirement we have. So uh, you can these days you can just sign up. You don't have to as long as you have an email address, anyone can sign up, and then you can start querying the uh, large language model. If you don't do that, it's a problem because it's you know it's costly. Every, every time we query the uh, the backend from OpenAI, we, we're paying for it. So don't overdo it, please. Yeah, so I also asked about what do we know about, about obesity and stress? And the manuscripts that were uploaded were uh, uh, on G-Network itself, a thousand manuscripts. Yeah, so anything mentioning G-Network essentially. Um, there were a thousand documents on diabetes and a thousand documents on aging. And these happen to be our you know, research topic of research at the moment. Um, you know, you can add your own if you ask us, because we can uh, we can find you know a thousand manuscripts on your favorite topic, and we, we you know we will we'll be able to add them. But even though you know and those topics you know are not directly related to obesity or stress, you still get some interesting responses. So in the final thirty seconds, uh, I just I just quickly go through Gene Cup, which is uh, another. Uh, this is actually what we did before we uh, introduced the rag uh, together with Hao Chen. Um, and with Gene Cup, uh, you basically use a deep learning model on all the abstracts of PubMed, right? So it's a different approach. And I'm at down to zero minutes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different it's a different approach and and that's what you see a, a lot of other researchers doing at the moment is that they will query all of pubmed pub pubmed right um but we what we've done here is we narrowed it down with the abstracts of pubmed and then uh, we used it you know people can create their own ontologies and this is an ontology for um, for substance abuse um and then it links it all up right so that's that's what what gene cup does and this is also part this is now a service that is part of gene network Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to down. Yeah, so this is, this is my final slide. I just want to show the team. Yeah, so uh, Shelby has been uh, working uh, together with Brian and Alex on the LML, LM stuff. Um, and then Arun, I want to mention because he, he improved the search for G Network so much. And then we have Shatak and uh, Andrew are working on the genome browser, the JBrowse tracks. And if you have, I mean, interesting tracks that we'll add, for example, be on, uh, on you know, haplotypes, but also uh, pangenome uh, tracks, uh, which are in the works. Um, yeah, and then we have the rest of the team, which is just amazing. All right, that's it. Thank you. How much does it cost to run a big old one of the LMM? Um, it's not very expensive. Depends on how, how much you use it, right? I mean, to to. No, it's it's, it's less than a cent. Okay. Yeah. But if you if you if you let a robot go, you know, then. Uh... <laughs> So I have a concern about the quality of the input data and then like the content of PubMed. For example, well, in the reputation field, one of the most influential and highly cited papers that was um, early emerging from this model, which have higher priority with its citation, would be the welcome trust funding of common disease GWATs, where they looked at seven diseases and three hypertension and found absolutely nothing. So you'll get a very high impact input to your your system, but there's no result. Then, of course, the opposite side is a small paper where they looked at 40 individuals with and without high blood pressure in some unusual population, poorly controlled, 
Um, I found that the sweepers are from a particular gene, the only gene that they actually looked at. And so these two papers provide very different qualities and values of, of information. And I'm wondering if it's possible to have any refinement to these sort of search models that can talk about those facts. Yeah, the, the, yes, absolutely. And it's a very good point. Um, garbage in, garbage out, right? <laughs> Um, and that's not going to change uh, very much, but um, yeah, what we, what we uh, I mean, what what the sector is doing is they are uh, looking at ways of adding agents. They call it. So the agents are methods that can uh, validate, you know, information that is out there, um, and they can still be garbage ultimately, right? But um, you know, if if you look at generic itself, uh, we have a lot of metadata which we are also pouring into the system, and that's being connected with the manuscript. So the real value is actually in just making the connections. Even if it's uh, you know just to generate hypothesis, um, but we still need humans, you know, before you before the, the machine starts creating our own experiments. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. You... Oh, yeah, I, I'm wondering if the, the our language model, if, if the word rat is mentioned in the title of the paper in bibliography. Like, so the paper has nothing to do with rat. They decided to make rat. You know, they're going to pull in that that example. Or is it smart enough to not include? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's smart enough. It's smart, it's smart enough. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really, uh, you know, the 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 corner that we turned five years ago. Uh, you know, we, I mean, when we use people, who, you know, who do Google search in the in the original form. You got really smart of re, you know, rephrasing your question so you get the answers you were looking for, right? It's because the system was so dumb. Yeah, nowadays it's the other way around. <laughs> the system is going, going to tell us how we should improve our answers. Follow up. So you talk about putting in three thousand papers, diabetes, and you know, aging, and aging. Yeah. Yeah. Were there any criteria for the collecting those three thousand papers, or did you just? It was fairly random. It was fairly random, to be honest. Um, <laughs> it was fairly random because it was uh, computer science people uploading. But um, uh, yeah, in the review process by people using the system, we are they are giving also hints and suggestions to add different papers and dropping up some papers. So every time we can you know regenerate the rack and and improve the system so it actually becomes better at what it does. Um, people also suggested to actually you know um, not only limited to manuscripts and our metadata but also to add books you know on on the biology essentially and hopefully get better results that way. Um, but overall, people will be pretty enthusiastic about the whole thing. Yeah. We're rushing a little bit behind schedule. I'm wondering if Ted, you can talk with them after first. Would that be great? Yeah, we'll talk horses. <laughs> awesome. Oh, here we go. This is Linux, right? Yeah, it's working out. Well, to get us set up, um, super thankful to be here. Um, it's a really good opportunity to be able to talk about some of this stuff. I think, uh, in general, the topic that I'm going to be presenting on is a little bit different than uh, some of the other topics. Um, no particular genetics in this actual um, experimentation, but we have a lot of other OICs. Um, all of these uh, experiments were performed in a uh, isogenic Fisher before war experiment, so I'll kind of go over that before we break the bag. Thanks so much. And so I'll briefly introduce myself as well. I'm Christopher Jin, currently an M2 in the uh, MCW MSTP program, uh, but I'm actually representing the Motorpack Consortium 
um, which is essentially the NIH's common fund project uh, related to exercise. And um, that was some of my previous work or involvement, but I guess was, was from before uh, I joined MCW. And so essentially, I think like, I would say pretty much everybody in the audience has a good understanding that generally speaking, physical ex uh, activity in some form or another is good for you. Um, and so I have kind of gone through the literature a little bit to try and find some, some really compelling figures uh, about specific benefit, uh, phenotypic benefits of exercise. And I think in terms of things like hazard ratios for all-cause mortality, um, just the amount of time that you spend exercising just creates such an incredible uh, phenotypic effect that it's really difficult to understand. I think that, um, you know, I was actually looking for a different figure about the relationship between VO2 max um, and all-cause mortality. And I think that I would say most people in the physical activity, you know, field would consider VO2 max to be the single best predictor of longevity out of any possible phenotypic characteristic. Um, and I think that despite all of the importance, uh, the actual specific mechanisms um, and details about what aspects of, of exercise um, kind of make it so important haven't really been well studied. And so this is just a representation of the actual you know, current literature in the exercise field. Um, and it seems pretty clear that across all of these relatively large studies, these are all you know, very clearly well uh, funded and large sample size studies, uh, but they don't really cover pretty much uh, every type of omic um, and don't really create such a consistent molecular map um, such that there is an incentive for you know, the motor pack consortium to kind of step in and, and work on this a little bit more to kind of uh, not only look at human data, but to look at rat data to get a better understanding of the actual molecular mechanisms of exercise across multiple tissues. And so this is a little bit of a schematic of, of the different sites involved, as well as the overall experimental design. Um, and I'll kind of touch upon a couple of different uh, items that I think will be relatively um, important and of interest for different omics researchers um, in relation to rats, even if you're not particularly interested in exercise, because I think there is quite a bit of you know, possible metabolic and phenotypic information that you could be interested in if you wanted to just look at the control rats, for example. Um, this is a little bit more of a detailed uh, explanation of the schematic that we just saw. And today I'm gonna to be talking about just the rats in particular. And even within this little schematic, we're really only going to be looking at the six month old rats that go through the endurance exercise training. The other aspects of this schematic um, are kind of under gone, uh, uh, undergoing, you know, different levels of uh, either sampling or analysis, and, and hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll be able to continue and fill in some of the blanks uh, across the different types of analysis that we want to do. And so if everything kind of goes along as planned over the next couple of years, we'll be able to take our original schematic um, and, you know, large studies within the literature and kind of expand it such that we're able to do all of these types of omic analyses on 19 different tissues in both rats and humans, which will give us a lot better of an understanding of the different molecular mechanisms that exercise is able to bring uh, in terms of phenotypic effect. And so for different resort researchers, this could look very different. You might have some people that are looking for you know, specific drug targets. You might have you know, specific uh, endurance exercise uh, training coaches that are interested in specific types of exercise. Um, the idea of what I'm trying to do today is just to give an understanding of the different tools um, and the different um, data sets that we are able to produce as a consortium um, for any people that might be interested in using this data, both to analyze different uh, metabolic parameters or exercise or, or really anything. And so to give a little bit more background into the specific part of uh, the exercise bout that I'll be talking about today, we have uh, essentially six rats, uh, six male rats, six female rats um, at four and a half different time points. I, I, I say four and a half because uh, there's also the control group. So really there's five distinct groups um, and they go through progressive protocols of exercise training. In this particular case, they're doing endurance training via treadmill um, over the course of essentially six weeks or six months of age at the very beginning all the way to six months plus eight weeks of training. Um, I think the diagram uh, 
at the top towards the middle makes uh, this kind of schematic the most clear. Uh, and then after their exercise bout, they're given essentially 48 hours to wash out um, the effects of acute exercise in order to more appropriately study the effects of chronic exercise, uh, which is the goal of this specific arm of the study. And then everything is you know, done to sacrifice the rats, uh, just flash freeze all of the tissues, and then all of the you know, chemical analyses, including transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, are sent to the different sites within the consortium. And then all of the data is kind of pooled for the general public uh, following publication of the paper. And so this schematic kind of uh, is a better understanding of what the actual you know, omics are available. Um, and I think that for anybody that's interested in analyzing possibly the relationship between different ohms, getting a better understanding of different uh, metabolic parameters, phenotypic parameters, uh, this figure probably does um, the best at, at offering an understanding of what data is available. Um, a little bit of an oversimplification, but every individual tissue went through transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. Um, and there are a couple more assays depending on what you're looking for. And so to give a little bit of a brief overview of the phenotypic changes, I've kind of brought up a couple of different parameters. The first you can kind of notice that the VO2 max in both sexes uh, in the exercise groups goes up pretty significantly, and in the control group, uh, not really so much at all. Uh, the body weight um, kind of st stays stable for the exercise groups, but increases pretty dramatically in the control groups, which is um, not unexpected considering they are going from six months of age to eight months of age and are relatively sedentary for the, for the controls. Uh, similarly, the body fat um, numbers and the lean mass numbers kind of correspond with the analysis that we just saw. And I would recommend you know, anybody interested to uh, look into these numbers more carefully on, on, on our website that I'll kind of describe in just a little bit. Um, just a little bit of an overview in terms of the analytes uh, in the actual omic experimentation that we've been working on. Uh, we did two different uh, types of analysis. The first being just a relatively simple F-test of all of the essential exercise regulated analytes in both the males and the females. And of note, we sex stratified our analysis because we've noticed that the response uh, in the male rats compared to the female rats is so different. I think that's one of the very big themes and I would recommend um, anybody interested in, in looking at the sexual dimorphism of, ex of, of exercise to really look into the raw data to get a better understanding of what uh, the sexual dimorphism looks like. Or if you wanna do your own analysis, there are uh, quite a few resources that were developed by the consortium that can allow you to do whatever type of uh, analysis that you would like. Um, and so we also, in addition to the F test that we just mentioned, did a time-wise comparison where we essentially just compare the controls to any individual um, time point to get a better understanding of the actual time-wise progression of the exercise training. And so this is kind of a big summation of the actual response to exercise. You can kind of see uh, by the kind of color differential proportion scaling that the response to different ohms is pretty dramatically different. Um, but you can also see by how large this image is, is that we have kind of an issue of high dimensionality in terms of the different types of exercise training, the different ohms that we have, the 19 different tissues that we had. And so in order to kind of represent all of these absurdly uh, large amounts of data, we had to kind of be able to summarize things in, in a relatively uh, simple way um, that one allows different researchers to actually like input their own parameters of interest uh, and look at things in, in their own unique preferences. A quick summation of the, I guess, uh, way that we uh, approached representing the unique changes in the exercise training bout is that we gave each of the individual time points kind of um, a, a dot, uh, and these represent changes relative to control. And due to the sexual dimorphic nature of it, we kind of separated that y-axis based on the differential response uh, in the different sexes. And so one example of, uh, of possible um, representation of a feature, which is the one on the left, could be that it would follow this type of a trajectory. In, in this particular feature, what, whatever it may be, at week one, only the males are considered to be differentially significant. At week two, it's still only males. But at week, week eight, we get to the point where this individual feature is upregulated in, in both sexes. And so you can kind of play with this type of a visualization um, 
to get a better understanding of what the sexual dimorphism looks like um, for different tissues, for different ohms, uh, for how many features there are. And you can kind of separate out these trajectories and kind of subset the features into different classes based on what type of response they have across the different time points. And so one of the most important aspects of our responsibility as a consortium is to be able to kind of um, expand on this analysis in a way that allows different people to plug in their own you know, tissues or ohms or time points of interest. And so one of the things that I'll go into a little bit more, and given the relatively over time warning that I'm getting, I'll, I'll kind of walk through the actual exercise response very quickly. But you know, one interesting thing you can also do is just look at different types of intersections between genes and uh, look through different um, stories because of the you know, huge amount of data that we have and the huge amount of data that we would love to share with the general audience. And so just one particular example is just that we have an increased regulation of lipid metabolism and within the liver, um, I guess, general metabolism status, we see higher levels of phosphocholines, which are associated with increased liver health. And of course, we recommend people look through the data hub, motorpackdata.org, in order to kind of explore some of the visualizations that I just presented. You can download all of the data, raw or processed, look at the differential abundance data that was already, you know, kind of just introduced, uh, and, and plot things according to the graphs um, that I kind of just presented very briefly on. Obviously, there's a ton of data, and so I'm just going to give a quick summary of mechanisms and you know different data sets that we actually have, uh, and obviously acknowledge all of the you know different sites and different consortium members uh, that are represented. I think I was probably a little bit too aggressive with the number of slides that I made for a 15 minute talk, but you know what? Here we are. Of a question or two, maybe. I'll just start. What kind of rats do you use? Uh, that was my question. The question is for the, the people on Zoom. What, what kind of rats are these? Uh, these are isogenic Fisher 344 rats. Thank you. <laughs> that one, I'm not actually sure about how they got to that decision. I think the original consortium decision, uh, when the project was first being planned, was to use mice. And then we realized, just literally due to the number of assays we wanted to do, the tissues were not large enough. And so we went with rats. Obviously, there are a lot more decisions than that, but that was a pretty big one. <laughs> Or two different uh, different skin uh, expressive buttons, but it's not very hard to convenient for the society to very look for it. Questions, comments? Otherwise, we have. Oh, sorry. So did you say that um, I had a question about the length of cells? Of course. It sounded like in one you said they were six ounces per group. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it, it kind of depends. There are a couple more in the actual control group, but in each of the exercise groups, there are six male and six female um, rats. And if you were to look at four just means four or five you have one. Right. So Four times six times two. Yes. Two three times. Yes. And four times three. Um. So the controls were actually only done at the eight week time point. There's not a corresponding time matched control at uh, each of the time points, which does introduce the the aging question um, of how that affects the general omics field. But in terms of cost and convenience, it wasn't really feasible for us to do. You know, eight controls at each of the time points. Okay, so, if I'm concerned that one weird male or one weird female, 
Yeah, we do um, our best in terms of presenting specific outliers and how that affects the structure of our data. But it is true that due to an N of six per, you know, sex per group, um, that that does play a pretty big deal in, in terms of the final conclusion. Especially in the interaction where we use. Thank you. We have time for a break. Um, we're going to leave at three thirty, and we are going to have two more talks. We're going to use the photos and autographs from my Dr. Abraham. Um, and then we're going to have a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Actually, Faith was invaluable when we were writing the P thirty grant because I could send her a section and she would copy out of it incredibly carefully and thoroughly down to the comments and etc at no matter what time of day or night I said so it was uh, impressive okay so you've already heard a little bit about some of the work at the center but what I'm going to do is give an overview of what the center is up to because I think that there are different people in the room that know different things so for some of you some of this will be a little bit remedial um well, I thought that was going to work no I can't advance How about that that doesn't advance is it because we have this laser on? Yep. Can we turn off the laser? Yeah. Okay. So as you'll hear, <laughs> uh, we've been at this for about a decade now, working with this HS population. And soon I will show you my next slide. <laughs> Look at that. Okay, great. Okay. So yeah, so we actually submitted this grant more than uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and here's sort of the original cast of the, of the grant from those people in film models and those people have moved on. Um, and we've been funded since 2014. And the big news of this slide is that we just got this renewed. And so we're funded now through 2029, which is as far from death as a PI can ever be. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that center. Initially, the idea of the center was pretty simple. We were going to make HS rats. And as you've heard from previous talks, HS rats is a genetically diverse population of rats. We were going to send them to people that would phenotype those rats. And that's what you see here on the board chart. And then after the people had phenotyped the rats, they were going to send us both the data about the phenotyped rats and also tissue from the rats that we would use to phenotype them. And then, as we described in earlier talks, we're going to work the relationship between genotype and phenotype, particularly gene losses, to try to identify regions of the genome that influence these traits that were being measured. The traits, as it happens, were mostly related to drug abuse because that's who was giving us the money, but that's all I'll show you on the sort of slides that's not our only interest. Um, and that worked. And what worked really well was that basic blueprint of sending people. Uh, outbred animals and having them phenotype the animals and then them sending us data and, and tissue for genotyping. And so actually a bunch of other, I might add, maybe use a laser pointer that Zoom can't see. So a bunch of other grants have now been funded that fit neatly into that org chart. So you see the original org chart had three phenotyping groups, but now there's many phenotyping groups. And most, but not all of these phenotyping groups are focused on drugs and alcohol, drug, drug abuse and alcohol. Uh, but in fact, we've worked with a number of other groups that have gotten funded to do other kinds of things like eyes and bones and muscles and et cetera. Um, and the basic pattern is still the same that after the phenotyping is done, we're getting data and we're getting tissue to genotype the animals. Uh, and this one here says more than 15,000 rats. I think we're now at about 20,000 animals that have been genotyped and phenotyped as part of this effort. And uh, here are some of the physiological traits in addition to substance abuse traits. A lot of these physiological traits are situations where we can kill the animals when we're done with the behavioral phenotyping and then send pieces of animals to people that, broadly speaking, study pieces of animals. And so those might be bones or muscles or testes or whatever. In some cases, we actually do phenotyping to live animals. But they're basically add-ons where, since we're already paying for the animals, we're already paying for the genotyping, and we already have a good way to analyze genotypes and phenotypes, the additional kind of marginal cost of analyzing other traits is really low. And so, for instance, if Corbett told you about body weight, we're not particularly trying to study body weight, but that's something that we've been able to study at that scale because of this. All of this is built around these heterogeneous stock animals. And here's a slide that I think you've seen previously, aided by strains mixed for about 100 generations, 
When we set up the center, it was Leah Solberg Woods, who's in the audience, uh, was the only person who was maintaining a colony of these animals. And for, and in fact, that was here at NCW, because at the time her lab was here at NCW. Uh, since then, she's moved to Wake Forest University, where she still maintains a colony, uh, but she really has been the person sending out the, the animals for essentially all of these efforts. Uh, so that's an old slide. Here we go. We've now gone past the hundredth generation uh, for these animals, so they're a little beyond the hundred generations. And I also put up this slide because I wanted to mention that before Leah Solberg Woods was maintaining this colony, the only reason that they survived was that Ava Rebe, who's in the audience, also somewhere. Appreciate you. You there? Okay, she was here. She walked down there. She is. She knocked down in the back. Yeah. Maintained this colony for a period of time uh, after the people who had started in the were done with it and before they had a club of her own maintained it. So uh, a very essential contribution was to maintain this colony for that period of time. And then very recently, we started to maintain a satellite colony from the others in San Diego, which is in a lot of users in San Diego, and San Diego is kind of far from uh, North Carolina. So this is, oh, can I get this play or not? I wonder. This is a movie that might play. It's a simulation of what happens over 100 generations of breeding. So these animals are not randomly bred. They're actually bred in a systematic way to minimize the relationships of the mates. But the point of this is just to show you that the haplotypes that came from those eight founders are going to break up and recombine. And so it's looking just at considering one chromosome here, you can see recombinations accumulating over time. And that means that the LD between nearby markers degrades over time. That gives us better precision of mapping. That is, if we see a marker that's associated with a phenotype, it has to be really close to the causal allele to still be associated with it because the LD has broken up those relationships over a long range. There is some loss of diversity that occurs as a consequence of all these generations of breeding at the Atlantic level, which is not too terrible. But we have lost some fraction of the original diversity to drift. For instance, with the habit of the mitochondria and the Y that they focused on earlier today. Um, in addition to a lot of short read genotyping of these animals, we've now done pack bio hi fi to 40x. And this is what we call ancient DNA. This is DNA from the founders, so from 1984, a long time ago. And we're now getting ultra long read. Uh, so we observe still on a little bit uneven coverage. Some of these samples don't seem to support ultra long reads, and so we're also going to do some high C at UCSD at the core there. Uh, but what we really want to do is get enough data that we can reconstruct. Uh, I said I pulled this slide to try to make it shorter. Working with Jonathan Sabat and Melissa Jimrick at University of uh, California, San Diego, at UCSD, we're interested in looking at other kinds of variations. So we have a really good handle on SNPs in this population, but we want to look at tandem reads and structural variants if they're not be higher. Reads. And eventually, might be interested in doing a pan genome for these eight strains and kind of thinking about this agent population in the pan genome context in the future. I want to briefly mention that, that MIBI, who distributes inbred strains, has a bunch of inbred strains, six of uh, which are really good surrogates for the original founders. These are like 0.99% genotype identical. Two of them are not so good, but they're decent surrogates. So, one approach, and you've heard that uh, Anne has been doing this in her lab. To figuring out whether or not this is going to be a good mapping population is to look at the inbred founders. Are they different to the phenotype that you're interested in? If they are, then it's probably a good mapping population uh, to use. So, um, distributing the animals, as I've already mentioned, is a key function of the uh, center that we have. We've sent out about 22,000, maybe you can't read, but it's a lot of that site, 22,000 animals. Again, Leah is the one who sent out the vast majority of these animals to people mostly in North America, but there have been a number of uh, smaller shipments to Italy and Germany and et cetera. Um, and now we have this colony that we're maintaining at San Diego, which we're calling HS West, and we did that with this disease after years and years of having no problems shipping animals all over the country. We started to have problems shipping animals all over the country. We have a lot of users in San Diego, so we're maintaining a local colony. Um, and then another essential feature is to maintain a database and an analysis pipeline. And so we actually have a database originally started by Corva, and I imagine that this would be sort of a part-time job for one people in the lab, one person in the lab, but it's a huge job for lots of people in the lab to maintain a database with all of the pedigree information, genotypes, phenotypes, et cetera, about all of these animals. Um, and so maintaining that and then making that accessible and, and you know, using fair practices to try and make the data available is a big job. Uh, that we're working on and would love to work with some of the people in this room to do a better job of already we're using kind of some of the natural places to store different kinds of data and protocols etc 
And then in particular, uh, there wasn't a good way to look at EQTLs in rats. And so working with uh, Hao and uh, Laura and Pejman, Dan Monroe, who was a postdoc at the time in my lab, uh, has set up something that we're calling rat GTEx, and we just exactly cloned the GTEx. You know, it's just like an instance, an instance of the GTEx server that's used for human EQTL data. Uh, and that hosts rat data on lots of different tissues now. And most of them are available now on the rat GTEx site. Um, and you can go there, there's a, a QR code for it, and you can then see whether or not there are EQTLs for your gene of interest in a variety of different tissues. Um, and then we have to have a way of genotyping these animals. And I think Dan, in particular, who's here for the poster, brought this down. Yeah, okay, great. So, Dan may be happy to tell you a little bit more about this. We have to genotype these animals, and we've done that from the beginning using low-pass genotyping, but for a while we were doing it with restriction enzymes, and we would genotype maybe about 5x, a small fraction of the genome, and then we transitioned to a, a different approach where we get uniform, very low coverage, to about 0.25x coverage. But because we know what the founders look like, we can impute out the genotypes. Dan managed to make a pipeline that could take the old uh, restriction enzyme based on the newer uniform uh, reads and uh, put them together basically to make one uh, common uh, set of genotypes. And those genotypes are accurate at about 99.75% versus uh, 30x genome sequencing. So they're highly accurate genotypes that we can use for GWAS. Um, and he has a paper about that that's, I think, not quite accurate. Um, and then the final thing is this analysis pipeline, and I'm not going to separate on this because Tiago just told you about it, but we have for a long time been developing an increasingly sophisticated automated pipeline to do the analyses of genotype and phenotype, particularly GWAS and lots of other kinds of analyses. Um, and so that's supported, having those tools, basically being able to send out animals, being able to genotype and analyze animals has supported lots of different collaborations, and we are always looking to add one more collaboration for the way. So anybody that's interested in working on this platform would, would love to cooperate with. Um, and then uh, I wanted to briefly mention, not the movie Gattaca, which is like a dystopian science fiction movie in which they select embryos for kind of fitness-related traits, and there's an over, there's a a well-to-do class that's highly fit because they were genetically selected, and then there's an underclass who are from naturally created embryos and they have lower fitness, um, and they're discriminated against, and that's like a dystopian science fiction kind of a plot. It's a terrible thing. I wouldn't support it. Um, but Radica is a very fun thing that we're doing. It's related to Gattaca. Uh, rather than selecting embryos, we actually select animals when they're about 21 days old to a weaning. And we can then rapidly genotype those animals. And based on the data that we've collected over you know, 20,000 animals, we can make predictions. So this is, Will, exactly what you were asking about. And I guess you genuinely didn't realize we were doing this. But yeah, we're doing exactly what you suggested, is that we're doing prediction of these animals. Uh, and it's just using totally standard polygenic prediction methods. So this is what and I talked about this at this meeting, I think, last year or something. Um, but uh, totally standard methods, originally directed developed for agriculture and more recently we have only used in human genetics. Um, and so our predictions are better when the heritability of the trait is higher, of course, and our predictions are better when we have larger numbers of animals as our training data. But in general, when we have 500 or more, more animals phenotype, even if they're not very heritable traits, we can start to make meaningful predictions. And that allows us to distribute to people animals that have never been phenotyped but are predicted to be divergent for any of the phenotypes we've previously studied. And we're calling that radica. And we think that that might be a good way to bring in people who are not geneticists but nevertheless understand that they need to study genetic diversity. And this is a really easy tool because it's just two groups, and most people understand two groups. Uh, so this is a, some of the phenotypes that we think we're pretty good at predicting, but I'm happy to talk with people kind of one-on-one -on -one if you're interested in this platform to tell you what we think we can predict. Uh, there's a lot of people involved. I've tried to mention those people as we're going along, but this is like a huge team effort, and I'm lucky to be able to stand up here and present some of it to you. And that's all. Question? Now that there's two colonies, you've yeah. got a plan to share readers? Yeah. Or what's the, what's the plan to? Yeah, that's right. So, so 
Aaron's question is, are we going to share breeders? And the concern is if we had two colonies that were separate, they might start to drift apart and become different. And so what we're doing is we're sending animals back and forth. And we've already done that once where we took all of the, we took boys from my colony and we sent them to Leah's colony. And then she mated them with the females that she had there. We didn't do that reciprocally the first time, but what we plan to do is every three or four generations have a reciprocal exchange of males so that we're transferring genetic material between the two colonies to avoid them getting too far apart. And also that kind of protects the genetic diversity, right? And these are affected population sizes larger. Yeah, there's Oh, and, yeah, okay. Um, give us an idea of um, how will the diversity change over the time? Okay. This is a pretty global. Do we have actually data on this? Yeah, we do. And actually, Tiago is working on a paper that's sort of the 100 generations paper that we're working title for it, but looking at, among other things, the loss of diversity. And we have pretty good genotype data from maybe generation 70 to 100. So we can, for those generations, pretty accurately track. The loss of diversity. And I think we got some older samples, maybe from maybe but we got some like generation 50 samples that I don't know if we've genotyped yet, but we'd like to genotype so we can have come on some of those earlier. In general, there's going to be some loss of diversity over time because we can't afford an infinite they want to get the population. Congrats to Mr. Hawley, our Bridge Rock Diversity Program update from Dr. Lindy Reno. Yay! Can everybody hear me? All right, good. Thanks. So I know I'm the last, um, and but we then have, we have a discussion after this, so I hope everybody sticks around and participates. So um, I want to thank Anne, really, and the RDD team for this. Um, Aaron and I keep getting credit for it, but I would say we did almost nothing. <laughs> so it really it was Anne. I also want to thank Anne for giving me this opportunity. She actually told me I had to do it. So um, anyway, <laughs> so I'm here to give you an update on the hybrid rat diversity program, or you can call it the hybrid rat diversity panel. We are, I consider us the program, but we're creating the panel. Um, so I thought there is a... Some people in the audience don't know a whole lot about it. I know we've heard a lot about the higher genius stock, but not so much about the HRGP. So I wanted to give a brief overview. So um, Boris Tabakov and Laura Saba, who aren't here, I don't think there's anybody from Colorado represented in the audience today, um, approached, oh, I'll say MCW, and it was Mary Shimonam and myself um, a long time ago to, um, to try to come up with developing a panel of inbred rat strains with the goals that are listed here. Oops, sorry. Yeah, preview. Where's the point? The top one? There we go. Okay. With the with the characteristics that are here, but really I can jump down to the last um, bullet point was really to model um what had been created with the mouse, the hybrid mouse diversity panel, which included um, a group of um Mexican bread strains and um, a couple of three panels, I think, in the mouse diversity panel, three panels of recombinant and bread strains. So the goal was to have genetic and phenotypic variability, the ability to map, um, and then to be able to do studies, you know, studying the environment, gene interactions, and those sorts of things. They approached us because I think we had the expertise in um, in the rat models, and, and Mary was leading the rat genome database at the time. So fast forward, uh, we started applying for grants, and our goal originally was to have one uniform program. It didn't work out that way. We were sort of broken up into two different programs. Um, but the the makeup of the HRDP um, it varies depending on what um, where where you look. Um, somewhere between 96 and 98 inbred rat strains. Um, in the rat panel, we um, our goal is to have um, 34 classic inbred strains. Um, a couple of them aren't available, um, so we'll see where we land once it's actually absolutely complete. The strains are listed on this table. Um, there is also a poster tomorrow with Mike uh, Mike Krasbowski has a poster that lists all the strains. Um, so you can dig into that in a little bit more detail. But the disease models um, range um, widely. Um, this is a funded project from OGRIP, so we needed to make sure that um, multiple NIH institutes would be interested in this. So we have 
cardiovascular and renal and alcohol and um, diabetes and all kinds of things, aging. Um, we did also include um, two recombinant inbred panels. Um, the first was the one that was developed by Michael Pravnik in, in uh, the Czech Republic. Um, that's the HXB BXH. And um, then the second panel was developed in Japan, the FXLE, LEXF recombinant inbred strains. And they also were sort of distinct in their um, in their uses in the past. So, and there you can see from this phylogenetic tree, there is a lot of um, of genetic diversity in addition to the genetic. So, in the goal of the program was um, essentially to, to create these animal models, make them available to users. Um, but most of the strains were cryo preserved and not available, or um, you know the the. The HXB panel was available in the Czech Republic and not so easy to get to other investigators. So um, our goal was to re-derive many of these animals, but then also to, um, to collect some genomic data. So the group in Colorado, um, Phenogen Informatics, was going to do um, RNA-seq to, you know, some, to develop some transcriptomes on the brain and liver, and we were going to do whole genome sequencing on these animals and collect some basic phenotypic data. And then make all of this information available through um, the rat genome database and um, the HIDP portal. So we have had a few challenges. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, I think some of you um, know about these. And the first is not coming up. Um, we have had some challenges in acquiring some of the strains. Some of the strains are extinct, um, and some of them are in locations that are um, posing some some challenges to us, but we're still working on them. In terms of re-derivation, we have one of the, we're, I think one of the world's experts at Pico Sagazawa at NCW, and she's done a phenomenal job along with Lynn and Hawaii is sitting in the back in, in the re-derivation process. We have had a few strains that we've struggled with, um, but most importantly, we've had a few health um, situations that have limited the re-derivation of one of the, the panels in particular. And then uh, we had the pandemic, so that certainly slowed us down. We weren't allowed to do any re-derivation in that process, but we were able to maintain the strains that we had derived at that point. And then the second aspect, partly due to the pandemic, um, it has cost us a fair bit more money than we expected, mostly in maintaining the strains before we fully completed the panel. And we also extended the, um, the number of um, sequencing runs because of the limited strains that we had, but there was a bonus to that. We did actually sequence some strains that we weren't planning to do, and I think that's been a helpful resource. So this is a busy slide, um, but it um, shows the strain re re-derivation pro um, progress, and we could probably just look at these pie charts. In terms of the classic inbred strains, um, we're really just waiting for we're waiting for three to complete their, um, the panel. Um, one is from the um, frog, and two were from Israel. We are working on those. Um, two of the three, however, are um, they have mycoplasm, so we're working on figuring out ways in which um, to safely get them to our institution and also be able to just distribute them to investigators that are interested. We have fully um, completed the, the Japanese RA panel. That one's fully um, available at NCW. And we have um, just under half of the strains from Prague. Um, this panel also has had some contamination that we've been working on trying to figure out ways to import clean animals and get those available. We did recently receive a supplement, so I hopefully we'll keep that moving. One additional um, aim of the grant is to require preserve all those strains just in case there is another pandemic or some other natural disaster. So Akiko and Lynn are always busy on require preserving the strains. Our target is to have 100 to 150 embryos for each of the strains in this red line. That's approximately at 100. So we're almost done. These are the strains that were re-derived more recently. Um, as you can see, our tank full of embryos is very large. <laughs> Um, five minutes, got it. Okay. In terms of sequencing, um, we have, we're making great progress here. Um, we have a few strains left to do for the classic inbreds. We have added some additional um, substrains, as I mentioned. Those are the bonus strains that are listed here, including resequencing, or sequencing the, um, the original HS founder. Um, we are still working slowly at the HXB panel, and then the Japanese panel is just about done. We originally sequenced some of the frozen tissue that we received with the embryos, so we're comparing that to some of the resequenced data from the re-derived animals as well. In terms of the HRDB portal, I'll go through this quickly because um, there is a poster by Shurjan tomorrow um, showing the development of the HRDB portal. 
They can get information about the um, the panel itself, the makeup of the panel, and then you can, um, it's sort of interactive, so you can select the strains that you're interested in. Um, you'll see which data have phenotype data that's been curated in, in the phenoliner tool, which data have, um, have variance information. You can select what strains you're interested in, analyze the strains either, or looking look at the strains either for variance available or phenotypes. If you're more interested in a single strain, you can certainly go to a, an RDB strain page, get information about the strain, um, see what um, phenotypes that they've been annotated with, and then dive into the data that way. You can also get individual variants for each of the strains um, through the same strain. So finally, I just want to say that if you want to access the HRDP resources, um, this is a high-level summary. We have 74 strains living at NCW. A few are available only at vendors. Um, if they decide to eliminate them, we'll bring them in. But right now, to save some money, we're letting them um, continue to distribute those. And then there are four strains that are still at academic institutions that we're working on bringing in. Um, we've been sequencing as quickly as we can. So we have 81 HRDP strains plus deformant strains. We do have a tissue bank with some classic uh, classic inbred strain tissue for males and females. I'm happy to collect additional tissues if anybody's interested. Um, we've begun doing RNA-seq, and there's a post around this as well tomorrow. Um, our goal is to do it across all of the classic inbreds for three different tissues for both male and females, and that information is being loaded into RGB to the browser that becomes available. And then um, Laura Sava proposed developing a mini HRDP, which is a subset of strains of the HRDP that people could use to, um, to develop pilot data um, to, before you sort of embark on studying almost 100 strains. So we're working on advertising that as well. So finally, visit the posters. Um, Alex Brody is a graduate student here at MCW who's been using it. She can show you the HRDP in action. Um, Wendy and Sherdan are from RGD, so they'll um, demonstrate some of the um, RGD portal and, and our HRDP data and different tools. And then Lynn is presenting a poster on the um, on some of the superovulation and, and reproductive um, approaches that are being tested in the lab. With that, I really just want to say thanks to the entire team. Um, it takes a, it takes an army to do this, not only on the HRDP side, but also incorporating all of the RGB group that's involved. I just clearly want to thank Mary. Uh, without her, we probably wouldn't have applied for this application. And, um, and little did she know what she was missing now. And my last picture is Mary. Let's see if I can play this. This is at one of the CT screens. And she's having a good time. So she started like this feeling, and um, it was fun to have. I stole that. She didn't know where I was taking it. <laughs> she was dancing all night long. So it, this has been a great meeting. She really enjoyed it. I appreciate um, appreciate her role in my in my research. So that's it. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, so I think it's time to move into our panel discussion. Um, we, why is there a panel On the agenda, let me. Let me you're free to go. Don't have to bother with this. Thank you. Should we pull some chairs out? So the panel was expanding the use of biological and data. I got this one. So we invited some of the people that are developing, you know, having resource type programs. Um, this one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, Abe's coming up. Um, and spring some chairs around. We've got Anne. We're supposed to have Laura Taba from Colorado, but she's unfortunately got COVID. So, they don't. How many do we need? Jim, Elizabeth, Darren. <laughs> I think maybe something also including what kind of things to worry with the goals of the programs and ask the future. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You scared me and said, What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Jim Ainslinger from the director of one of four mutant mouse resource and research centers. I come here as kind of a rat person in mouse clothing. I I, I do both. <laughs> so for the one who hates me for being a mouse person, uh, mice are not uh, small rats. <laughs> oh, it told me that. <laughs> I went to Jackson. I said they're just just big, the big mice. <laughs> That's obviously not true. Um, so we're a U forty two. So uh, that means that we can generate program income. And we can use that um, to help support our program as well. Um, we do utilize that money to. Make sure that we can do things like including some of the research that goes back. Um, so, if, if you have mice and you generate uh, transgenic mice, any kind of genetically modified mice, or if you have a unique phenotype, um, you can share it through us. And I think all of the resources here, in some form or another, are really so that uh, to, so that you can fulfill your NIH sharing guidelines, right? So that's really important. Um, we cryopreserve it for free. All you have to do is pay for shipping to us which I know is becoming increasingly expensive, but we're working out methods to try and make that cheaper, like sending us dead mice as opposed to live mice. Um, overnight shipment, we can still cryopreserve sperm. So, so that's what we do, um, and we provide that as a service. Um, we do provide uh, material back to you once, like you can have a sperm sample for, for the, for, without cost, um, but we, most of our stuff is cryopreserved. Unless it's something that is actively being purchased by, by people who we'll buy it on the shelf, but we really don't have any live commons. Yeah, and hopefully I'll be remember when I said 15 minutes. <laughs> Always with Brian, who's the director of the Right Research Center. And uh, it's ironic because I started out as a mouse geneticist. <laughs> <laughs> and switch what resources you run. So it's kind of bizarre. But I think um, we're funded by a P40 from NIH. So we um, it's mostly to serve as a repository. And we have a very small percent of our budget that can be used for research, but that has to be related to the repository function. Um, we're, we're kind of the home for 
or orphan models, I guess, you know, the, the, the important models that people have made that wouldn't have commercial value, so the vendors don't want them. So that we're a place where they can archive those, you can distribute them. Um, we also uh, provide services. So when people want to work with rats, they don't know how to, they don't have housing, they don't know so we can help them with that. We do we do make models as well. So those are but again, I think it's really for us to be able to do, make sure that important models are archived and, and serve as Jim said, it's a way to share them to the people. Okay. Very good. Um Department of Physiology here and collaborator with uh, Anna Mindy. Um, largely the resources that we have would be the, the developed new transgenic and gene hack model. We've also tried to reserve a large number of strains here. Um, we, we built these resources over the years through programs like R24, animal research programs. Um, but the, the resource that we have is basically currently maintained through feeds, through the next storage feed to the, to the users that store their that are starting to grow, um, or um, just be for developing models. But um, a lot of the strains that we've developed in these R24, res R24 resource programs are available to anyone who wants to uh, study them. Um, and so we are always excited to find them that want to be grown up to be derived uh, or re re uh, um, reanimate a strain uh, from prior preservation. Okay, so hopefully, no, I am. You've heard my voice too many times in the last few days. Um, I'm Amy Quiddick, and I'm the, the head of the Red Genome Database. Um, and RGD, even though it is a resource, it is actually funded by an R01 mechanism. It's the only model organism database that is funded by an R01 mechanism and it is funded solely by um, NAWS. So it's kind of the odd dog out um, for many reasons and it makes it challenging to uh, to write a grant because I mean, I'm a resource, you have to have metrics, but I'm not a resource, I have to do research in the current gen and things like that. So then it's an interesting, it's it's got its pluses and minuses. Um, Anyway, we, uh, we will take any data that you guys want to give us, as long as it's not high throughput data that is already available in other uh, resources. Um, but you will see that, uh, I think Wendy's talking about the fact that we're taking GEO, which the metadata in GEO, if you try to get information out, it's not very standard. These people just kind of shut everything in. So uh, we developed a way to standardize how that data is defined in the metadata. And if it is not mapped to the most uh, recent um, uh, assemblies, we'll remap. So we're putting the change on this. All right, so a lot of the discussion among the audience and the panel members, but I, does, does anybody in the audience have any questions for the resources or? I start. Does anyone know what the status of the Japanese model resources in Kyoto? So the question was, what's up with the um, NBRP? It's still in existence. It's just not solely rad, though. It's, it's pretty expensive. Um, and I saw a server is, I don't think it's there anymore. Um, but they still have animals available. They're doing a, a lot of knockouts as well for those and I think they, they do distribute them more. Uh, yes, but you just asked me and my brain is dead. <laughs> um, yeah, Masa, I think they, uh, I think I hear, do you remember who we sent it to me? Yeah. <laughs> I can send you the information. <laughs> Any questions? There used to be one in, in Germany a long time ago. I don't think that one exists. But I think it's 
I don't think the one in the Netherlands, like, didn't they have some resources? I guess that was Norbert's, but then there was Edwin's. Edwin's. So, one of the things I think about a lot is outreach and dissemination. Create these models and how do we get them to the users? How do we make sure the users are aware of them? Um, I think, you know, are you doing weight metrics? You know, we can do specific web stats and things like that. But from the audience's perspective, like, how do you see information? How do you digest it? Is it in the papers? Is it off Twitter anymore? Oh, Sorry. <laughs> How do you find a model? I feel like I'm asking an obvious question that all of you know the answer to, but it's curious to us. Like, if you're interested in, in I, I want a rat that does the next I want a mouse that is not down to the how, how do you feel about it? Manuscript. Manuscript. Jack's website. Jack's website. It's uh, IMSR, is for mice anyway. Um, I, I think RGD is a great resource for rats. Um, you know, for if you have any, you know, any gene, you could look, they have a nice list of rats that have variations in that gene. Like, that's a great use for rats. Yeah, I'm sorry, we, we're kind of relying on that too. I mean, we're doing good product, which is different is we're trying to build a model, right? So it's not one, you know, it's not one gene kind of um, such. Which is what a lot of inbred strain models have been. Of course, a lot of people in Europe have been looking at selective lines, which for decades have used that same kind of approach. We think there's an advantage to what I said, like doing 40 times risk. Um, but it's funny problem to figure out where those users are. So, right, if you're just several of us are going down to Chicago for the Society for Neuroscience meeting, and we actually have a booth where like, the vendors are, but then we're trying to communicate to people that it's not the same while graphic. Because it's not something that ever existed before. So people are looking for it. It comes to exist and it's going to create a market for it in the same way that, you know, somebody wants to create a market for bubbly brown sweet water, right? Nobody historically, nobody wanted bubbly brown sweet water. That's what we call it. Convince people that actually they did. Um, so we have a demo like that. I have a question on, on similar to that. So, rat users, I mean, We've drank the Kool Aid, you know. We we think about genetics and, and background and things like that, but I think a lot of rat users don't, and they go buy a rat. And so, what is that rat? Oh yeah, we just bought a lab rat. What is it? So how, how do you how do you know how would you tell people that you know it's important to think about genetic background and get HS or get HIV clear or somehow um, in the knowing that. Expensive. I mean, and, and so if you have to study 5,000 rats, that's not feasible if you're, you know, you can study 20 or 10. Right. How do we deal with that? I mean, what's the cost of that experiment? It's a counter experiment. <laughs> How do we get everyone else to drink the beer? I'm finding your beverage thing is analogy. Can you read that? So, one, one thing that I've been thinking about, I've been at Big Forest for eight years now, and when I went to the Department of Fizz Farm, okay, all the drug abuse research, and they're very good at using indirect treatment with me. The minute they heard that we needed a thousand rats, they all went into four rooms and how we were good. Um, and so I've now gotten a few people who are interested. And and one of the things is it's like, okay, so you can do 20 rats a year, but you've been in this business for 20 hours. So if you start small, right? And you just start instead of using a long hour, you can like order using a set. Over a period of time, you're going to have to have enough rats. So, Geneticists could, could maybe do something with that. Um, but it is definitely an uphill battle. You know, there's a few people that, that see the beauty of that and everyone else, they're going to say it's worth it. But it's, it's a challenge, I think, that aids them the best job, aids them the wonderful market.
one of the things that I hear from everybody, like all those different camps that have labs that have done this, is that they never really understood their phenotype like until they saw data from hundreds of animals, right? Because they would have a few outliers, and those are maybe the animal and stuff out. And then they kind of realize, like, no, if you find them, never had a bite of animals, do this weird thing that I think was real. So part of the marketing for the people that don't want to do this research for animals is that actually it's going to be a good thing to make now. Well, I think we have time for a question, but my comment is very few people actually want to study your app for a mouse, for a clone, for a worm, because our question is about human biology. And they want a tool to study that, and that's where my lawyers come in. So I, I I think about this a lot and have really focused a lot of my work around cross species data comparison and using data to actually justify the use of the animal and the use of which animal. So that if a rat is the appropriate animal for what you're doing, the data are there to align with the human data and show that this is this is where we want to go and this is what I should be doing. And so I, I, this is for everyone, but when you think about all the data you're generating, all the results you're generating, yeah, my question is how do you present that in a way such that a non-rat enthusiast will see something they can grab onto and become a rat enthusiast to take those models? Well, I, I can start on that a little bit, but I'll say from two different resources. Uh, one of them, I will give you the alliance of human resources. Um, that is a collection of other it's a it's a group of all of the major model organism databases. And we've gone through we've gone through a huge effort of harmonizing the data so that it is standard across all of the different species and it is tied together through gene orthology. So you can go in there and, and look to see if there are alleles or models or gene variants or uh, across those different organisms. Um, so those are the model ma major model organisms. In RGD, we kind of do the same thing with these weird orphan um, mammalian species that don't have their own database. So we have we have dog variants, we have pig variants, um, we have the novel genomes and, and we try to tie it together again through pathology. Sometimes we have to go through the human to the, you know, to go through the human to the next organism. But that it, we do try to, and, and then incorporate some of the, the biology that we learned from the rat, the mouse, the human, so that you could actually go into these other species and look at variants if that's if that's helpful. Um, if we had unlimited resources, we'd curate other data from other organisms. But you know, that's that's our way that we can. Science question. Um, human genetics is often uh, wonder about how complex traits are so hard to primitive. They sometimes say it's only we can count case animals, but the whole thing is primitive. Primitive, um, they are of place, some of the predicted value will be uh, very good. Eventual accountability might have to be good, but I still find, I still find, or in the that subject, like with a predicted your polygenic score, given an animal the increased potential of environment, they're still not that uh, oligogenic. Uh, is this a mystery that I must be scientifically or getting closer? I think I missed the critical alternatives. Do you think that the traits that we're mapping are oligogenic or are not oligogenic? Um, yeah, yeah, I didn't have sure. Okay. Um, uh, does the genetic accountability of complex traits, um, the, the human genetics is something that, uh, okay, there are more models of so the human traits, but uh, that optional of some of the advantages we can show their genetic pedigree environment. Um, we are going to get something that's relevant for human studies. Right? So this touch point has a uh, year after year, last year, it happened there as well. Probably 
things uh, that they look on the, the, the raft or move them here off to much next time. Well, Brittany is going to give a talk, is it tomorrow or Saturday? Yeah. Saturday. Brittany's going to give a talk that perfectly addresses some of the things that we're doing on that, which is trying to take polygenic signals that we get from animals and put them together with polygenic signals that we get from humans and see if there's overlap. So it's kind of the flavor of what Greg was talking about earlier today. All oh, it's a different way of doing it. Um, but I do agree with Greg that it's really important to actually provide empirical evidence that our genetic models are relevant to the human phenomenon. Like, just make kind of an assertion, or you know, well, we're taking cocaine, humans take cocaine, and therefore we're studying cocaine use disorder. It's not satisfactory to you to a vigorous, rather not person, and you can't expect people to just accept that that's true without providing evidence. I think that a lot of it's on us to kind of ask that. It's, it's human, but the largest uh, 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 all of us, I mean, are human. But not pedigree based. And now your rack is uh, over 10,000. Of course, this is trace. You see the genetic of complex trace is a very long journey for both human and rack, or do you see a regression for coming out of rack? Um, I mean, it's definitely going to be a long journey. It's going to continue to be a long journey, but hopefully, as we go along, we're learning useful things. And to me, I have never outlived the belief that we're going to identify novel drug targets. That one of the really important things that we're going to do is we're going to identify genes that you could manipulate from small molecules because that's the main tool that's available to us. And one of the major outcomes, the practical outcomes of what we're doing is to identify novel targets. And We've done some of that, and uh, you know, obviously, we're not going to take those necessarily all the way through stage three clinical trials, but I think that's a really important thing for us to keep our eyes on. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. I think, I think, in some ways, we do a, a poor job of this, and that we often tell the tale of things that are already proven, right? Oh, look, this works as a model because we can recapitulate what we see in humans or whatever. It's really the dark matter, the stuff that we can't explain that have clear signals, but we really have no idea what's driving. And that's harder to convince people that that is related to humans, but it tells us something very fundamental about the biology. And I think those are the important things and harder to get funded, but the important factors of what we're doing, right? I mean, I think that's. I have a comment, which is that one of the determinants of success in funding to keep the right genomics enterprise buzzing is to have appropriate representation of our community on the NIH study section. And I don't know if anyone in this room is currently a chartered member of the NIH study section that's involved in this area. Maybe I just don't know. If Leah was the last person on the Bill for Health and Disease. Uh, you cycle up now, huh? I cycled out, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Please, sir. You know, otherwise, we don't have a voice, and we're being swapped out by the vast amount of money that continue to. I mean, the last time I heard about 80% of the projects in genome health and disease were GWASs, still GWASs in human populations that have been going on sucking vast amounts of money and producing. So just, just to piggyback on that, this yeah. is very real. I don't know if there's anybody in the room who's not here. <laughs> 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 when I started on PhD, it was just very clear there were most, most were human geneticists, and they did not like rotor models. They said, what does this have to do with humans? And thankfully, the program officer got several animal model geneticists on there, and so over time it gets switched. But, but I'm not there anymore, and they don't continue that effort. The human geneticists don't really think we're relevant, so it's really important that we do our, our representation on the study. Totally agree. Totally agree. The I know people pick up on it, but a lot of the studies that are funded 
what is, you know, through our center are, are these UO1s? And this is because NIDA identified this problem a long time ago that the rodent research stuff that they were interested in funding didn't review well the available study sections. And they set up a PAR with the UO1 mechanism. And one of the people that are terrible, I just said, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that that UO1 mechanism allowed them to do is to form a specific study section, right, that had a makeup that was appropriate. So they wouldn't bring in people who would say, oh, I'm not interested in anything that has road research in it, right? All of the people are, are you know, road researchers and therefore open to that kind of research. And that's been really essential to the to the center that I run is that you know we have that you know, we have we have a ROI fund of things that fund the regular study section stuff that we have not. But um, setting that up has been really important. And I don't know of other institutes that have gone to such lengths to get study sections that aren't just inherently thinking in that group thing, right? And the group thing is most people all doing studies are going to be humans because they want to review. But it's a real, real problem for sure. This has uh, maybe a of interest to people in the NIA uh, has taken a similar approach and this is mostly all time residential research around setting up UO1 mechanisms where they will align certain grants for human studies, certain grants for model studies. And so they'll find six UO1s from PR. They'll say two of these are going to be animal studies, one's going to be a cell model study, and the rest of you are going to do human studies. Um, and that's becoming more common, so probably something to look for if people are doing aging or measurable research. Um, I don't know about other ideas, but it, it seems to be working really well. I'm curious if there's any opportunities that you've heard of across the trans NIH, because NHLBI doesn't do resource, um, but there is this trans NIH thing that, you know, most of what was in the institute, somebody still has to claim it, but I don't know if you've seen any kind of opportunity like that. I mean, I think most of what I've seen is very resource generated oriented, which probably is. Well, part of those is that we can get those opportunities, but they, there's so few of them and they're almost over generic uh, as opposed to focus on biology and being able to do Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say one thing. So I I don't want to talk politics, but it really depends on what happens, right? There, there are, if, if you all are not aware, uh, there is a, um, a plan out there to reorganize NIH to reduce the number of, of institutes. And it would be dramatic, um, the effect on resources, I think. Um, the other thing is that um, I'm funded through ORIF, which is through the Office of the Director. Um, the Office of the Director now uh, took on uh, the All of Us project, so it moved out of NHGRI and into ORIF. That I think tripled the size of ORIP, and I don't know what their budget's going to be. So, you know, so we're kind of in the middle of this weird place where we don't know if all that money came to ORIP, and they don't know. So, there there are other things to, that you should be worried about too, just in general about <laughs> these resources. <laughs> whether they're good or not. Not I don't know. I, I guess like I could retire them. Find another gym. Yeah, that was one of my questions. What are the biggest challenges, and what would you do if you had a bunch of technology? Because they are all when you grant. I mean, Aaron is to a service model, but um, yeah, they're paying for embryos that are stay whole, but when they still need to be. Okay. Well, and inflation, inflation's hit all of us for resources. The cost of liquid nitrogen has gone through the roof. So I don't know, you know, I mean, it, it, it is expensive for us. Um, so, yeah, me still, I mean, we have many um, stories. In study sessions, you know, past, you know, the advocate in study sessions, 
talk about the value of a model and what the model actually tells you because everybody wants to assume that if you see something in a mouse that's what you see in humans but that's not really true it tells us something about the biology that's fundamental and maybe that fundamental biology biological principle we can apply to human but it may not be the exact same way and to get to your point about um the the you know the, the immune function in say mice that is a major issue, right? This idea of reproducibility, and NIH is really thinking about this. We've all heard about, you know, this, uh, you know that, that uh, animal models are not reproducible. I could, I could argue that no experiment is completely reproducible. You're not going to get exactly the same value if you even do the same experiment twice. It doesn't matter if it's an animal model or not. What I think the new mantra, and I hope this is really changing at NIH, and I, I felt like it was, that they now want to talk about replicability. And can we repeat the experiment, but knowing that there are going to be parameters that are different, and can we resolve what those are? And I think that's maybe more important in trying to get that message. Um, one more time, sorry. Yeah. A very interesting thing happened uh, very recently. We got a paper that we commented in Europe that uh, the paper says that whatever we plan to do uh, modeling in this case we were successful because we couldn't replicate all the uh, phenotypes in that model. But the um, media put down saying, what do you expect? Your data is fantastic because it can put this and this into a separate compartment and look at uh, modeling as modeling cars and sets. Of, uh, of the whole that we can use basically for the, the parallel or stack power. And so the expectations are changing, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. but we will have to convert those that we can see. So I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to briefly say we all agree that we should be able to show parallels between what we're doing in rodents and humans. But maybe a more conservative thing, since we're on the good state mindset here, is to at least show that yeah, is to at least show that we're finding the same thing in rats and mice. And I mean, we have the right people in the room to think about how you would do that. And that's something that I've been thinking about, and I think a number of people in the lab have heard me talk about ideas for, but. That's a really conservative thing, right? If you can't even show that you're finding the same genetic signal in mice and rats, which live in very similar conditions, right? And a similar lifespan, et cetera. If that's not going to work, it's much less likely, much less realistic to think it would work to go all the way to humans, which are more distant for this. I disagree with you. Yes, yeah. yeah. so I, I, I agree, but I disagree because I think there were definitely circumstances where mice are and rats are very different, oh, yeah. right? And so I'm not so sure that's necessarily oh. the way to go. Okay, so I love, I, I would love to have a disagreement, but we might agree. <laughs> so <laughs> you imagine a triangle of, of mice and rats and humans, right? It might be a triangle where all the different Things are a nice lateral triangle or something like that, right? But it might be what I'm suggesting is that humans are maybe further out, right? That rats and mice are relatively more similar, and humans are the further out point. So maybe first let's focus on can we show that there's good translatability or transferability between knowledge between mice and rats? But maybe you disagree with me, and that'd be great. That would be great. 
But we I need to agree with it. It's 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 I think for some things that, that that is absolutely true. I think for others, no, they're different, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that gets back to this whole idea of it's different. We use different models because they tell us different things, and sometimes one is appropriate, and sometimes others are more appropriate. And we have to be better. I think we're we're not very good because again, what I see is most people go directly to the mass media because they're little, they're easy to work with, people are feel comfortable with them. They do. And and sometimes the mouse is an awful model. They should be using a big for example. They don't want to because they, they're expensive. They don't know how to work with them. So I actually think that we have to be smarter about the species that we're using. And the quite depending on the question that we're asking. But I agree sometimes just showing that if we can have all the models agree, it, it gives us more confidence that humans would be so yeah. And regrettably, I, I agree with you that you should use the right model. Right, let's put it in question. <laughs> and it might be a slow. Okay, I was going to say something really uncomfortable. Sure. <laughs> so there's a ton about my data um, that I want to share. That is, the um, value of the model system is not only continuing with the inventory mindset on this side, but also continuing with the auto reflection. Mindset, the cell line, the organism. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, for instance, GRI, when they want to support word function, people like going to say, let me do the quicker size in cell line. I did 100,000 previously, let me do two meters now. Right? And the drug trials uh, are principally on cell line. That's one reason why, by the time they work in cells, they don't work in the body because the cells are in the body cell. So, the sweet spot for the rest of the model is kind of Bible in community. This defines is uh, a good, uh, or is a killer application. Somehow the whole body physiology is genetic impact with a late onset phenotype that, that applies or, or warms the model very well. Uh, we need uh, the white paper or uh, champion the idea and again loudly and uh, out there. Is anyone here from the UK? Uh huh. Okay, one. Uh, how difficult is it to be radical? Yeah. 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 But uh, seriously, Europe, it's, it is incredibly difficult. I've had researchers you know, reach out to us to do the experiments in, in the United States because it is becoming very difficult to do animal experiments for lots of different reasons. And, and you know, it, it, it's it's of course concerning to all of us, the, the health and welfare of our animals, but um, it is concerning to see the push to organoid models and things that really can't recapitulate the physiology in a, in a complete vertebrate animal, right? And we have to be very careful. And I think it just teaches us that we need to be exceptional grant writers to point that out, right? Because they're gonna be pushing for, why aren't you doing an organoid model? Why aren't you looking at cell lines first? Why aren't you doing that? And and that we we do have to be conscious of that. Okay, I'm I'm going to try to disagree with it. Okay. Let me argue that what all of us who are in the on learning model learners need to do is deeply engage with the human data, and and that should be the guide star for everything we do in model learning. So I, I finished my talk today with does this work with humans? It is a really quick and dirty thing we can do with what data we get. Quickly, most of my lab works on Alzheimer's, and my Alzheimer's class has slide after slide after slide about how this mouse model, how this market model, how this cell model is relevant to human disease in, in detail. Uh, not, not that it has a you know very high level phenotype sort of looks like it, but here, here's the expression signature, here's the mass, here's the cell, here's the genetic mass, here's the cardiac mass. Um, it, it's a massive investment. Half my lab now basically studies human data. Um, and But the whole reason to do that is to figure out how to interpret and ultimately design the animal model of experiment. And so rather, I mean, it's what comes out, of course, if we're looking at cross species, it's all species with human data. Um, but I would prioritize really engaging the human data and, and try to you know, bring human geneticists. You know, in that way. Yeah, go ahead. 
I just want to ask somebody responding on my mind. I just want to know if you also highlight when it doesn't. Because yeah, my spot. Yeah, so yeah. So we go, I mean, I'm thinking about the Yeah, so therefore, if you're you're trying to need a preclinical model for a certain kind of thing. Here's the mouse you might show it. We don't mouse show it. Here's a cell model that can do it. We'll be speaking to the same All right. All right. to the scientists all the time that have what I consider to be a really simplistic idea that I play nice with like humans because they want their minds to be able to think. Um, and if this gene does, does something different in the mouse and it does in human, then the mouse is a terrible model and they can't use the mouse. And it seems to me that number one, studying, so we didn't have the, the animal models. We wouldn't even know what questions to ask about them. So the utility of the animal models is that it's kind of a, a meta utility as opposed to gene by gene, what is this gene doing, what is that gene doing? Um, it's learning what questions to ask um, and then trying to find a way to answer it in a human way you can't manipulate it. Um, so, so, um, and the utility is much more generalized and then a kind of higher cognitive level of information. And, you know, is our mice and rats? Well, of course, they're more similar than they are to human beings. And also, there's differences that you can almost nothing that I have to do with. So, there's a utility of the animal mind, including our own models, that come from this. Classes of genes, there's going to be a commonality between the mouse and the human. Not the gene by gene, that can be the genes as almost apex and activation on most humans. And the important mice may have been important humans, but it's a different gene. And therefore, we would need to understand where the things come from. Because that's not a problem to answer. So I, I actually, I would argue that one, one potential kind of ideological thing up that, that I have and I, I will, I will impute to everybody else in this room is that genetic mapping is really fun. And it's really fun when you find something. Cool when you see the peak and, and you know, you walk is fun. And that puts us in a, you know, a really defensive front because the human geneticists come to us and they say, oh, does that mean, or does that look it mean anything to us? And we often look for that connection at the level of the gene point. And I, I would just want to point out that one of the results that Greg shared this morning was that we actually, at the level of genes, we can't do mouse, mouse training. Much less you know, rat translation, much less sports kid translation, much less even anything. The thing that translates is often a much higher order process, something at the level of unique, something at the level of development, something at a much higher level of complexity. And I think one thing that's underappreciated across the board is that the genetic diversity. Gives you and uh, gives you a, a strategy to create the physiological shared DNA. And I think we all kind of intuitively understand that, but that fundamentally, I think, is a killing of the genetic diversity resources that we have. Not that that it's not that we can necessarily make a prediction at the level of individual variants. It's that we can place those 
individual variants into a much, much higher order picture of individual agent attachment. And I don't think that, yes, certainly I don't think the human genetics is there yet. Yeah. It's starting the polygenic risk scores are failing if you take a, a European world population and try to say, it's an African population. But um, anyway, I thought I'd throw those blocks on the modifier um, one in and out. So, can we respond? I'm willing to bring you to the song right now. Exactly what we've just been discussing. At least you got people showing. Well, it is 4 45, and we said you were going to end up here if people have more to talk about. We can talk to each other. I agreed with what Greg said, <laughs> but I couldn't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I always say your your model depends on your question. You got to use the best model for your question. And before we all go, ladies, do we have some place where people might gather for dinner tonight? Send out a suggestion for a location, it's a restaurant called Bagels, like the public floor exercises that most of you all know. Very odd and so frankly, we'll see. I think it's a, it's a traditional old, it's been there for a long time. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, thank you. It's been a great day. Yeah. Great talk. Great discussion. Yeah. 8.30 tomorrow morning. Oh, earlier than tonight. Uh, yes, I think so. I will make sure that we start at 830 tomorrow, so, and there will be a uh, light breakfast again, so if you want to, uh, have a comment or breakfast, we will get started, and you can use your response. We'll see you next time.